Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to everyone that's joining us here in the Fusion Room, and also a very good morning to everyone that's joining us online. My name is Joseph Fowler, and I'm the Head of Arts and Culture here at the World Economic Forum. Before we start today's session, I'd just like to do a little bit of housekeeping. Could you just take a moment to check that your phones are on silent so we don't disturb the session once we start? Today's session, Men, Women, Pathways to Equity. It's a great privilege and a great honor for me to welcome to the stage the, exec the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of the Women of the World Foundation, Jude Kelly. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And um, the thing I'm going to talk about this morning is really me um, and my journey into trying to make sure that I tell the stories of women from all over the world because of the opportunity I got to be a woman who tells stories. And I'm going to specifically then talk about my father, and the critical relationship that I believe exists between men who love women, particularly fathers, and how they express that to their children and what that does to the child. So I'm going to begin way, 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 way back. You can see this is a picture from Leji's Caves in Somaliland, where we did a wow a few years ago. Now, I don't know what that little picture says to you. This is a picture drawn maybe 30,000 years ago. When I saw it, I thought, oh, that's me. That's a little girl with a skipping rope. And I immediately identified it with, because when I was a little girl, and let's face it, I'm still quite little, I first involved myself with the arts because somebody put on the record player the Sugar Plum Fairy. Dun, 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 dun. And I immediately felt this music inside me, and I started skipping, skipping like this. And I felt just like the Sugar Plum Fairy. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And as soon as I told my father that, he said, well, let's get going. And he allowed me to go to ballet classes. Now, I want to just keep on saying that my mother was always supportive but it was my father's support that made me think it was legitimate. And I'll come back to that later. Now, when I said to the chap that is the curator of the caves, they're amazing, these cave paintings, aren't they? I wonder what the men and women were like that did them. He said, women didn't do this. So, of course, I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, women don't do these things. And it reminded me of the crushing nature of the word no, or can't, or don't, or inappropriate. And how even our very history as women has had people telling us theologically, philosophically, and biologically that we don't, we can't, we shouldn't, and we won't. But you see, we do. And that expression of joy, now that we know so much more about the history of cave painting, we suspect that 75% of those cave paintings, in fact, were done by women. But you know, it doesn't matter on one level. What matters is that there's a girl, in my opinion, expressing joy. I went on to be a storyteller in quite a kind of conventional way, if you see what I mean. I'm a theatre director. I've directed superstars. There's Ian McKellen, directed him in The Tempest and a couple of other things. You'd recognize him as Gandalf, perhaps. And there's Patrick Stewart from Star Wars, although actually fetchingly in pajamas, in a show I did called Johnson Over Jordan by J.B. Priestley. I continue my work with dance. That is me directing all the Paco Pena play, uh, shows, flamenco shows. Uh, Chekhov again there with Ian McKellen. And the kinds of theaters I work in and have worked in and opera houses, etc. But you know, I came to a point in my life where I realized that much as I love storytelling, mainly the texts, mainly the work, the operas, the shows, the plays that I was being asked to direct were plays that told us the history of men, the anguish of men, the worries of men, the problems of men. And women in general were there to assist those problems and those achievements. And I thought, this is not where I believe the history of the humanity that I believe in needs to get to. And I started to think about women's stories, obviously my own, but many, many women 
from across the very, very wide world and thought, across that whole wide world, how many plays and pieces of music and pieces of art actually reflect what is actually really happening throughout the whole of the history of women? And you know, it's so few. As an artist, it's so few. And I do believe that the story, if it's made central, gives you the potency, the agency to say, and this is my right. I have rights if my story exists. And if your story is marginalized, you do not really have rights. And that led me to think that maybe for a while in my career as a storyteller, I would transfer from fiction to fact. And I would invite women from right across the world to tell their stories, to tell their stories together, and stories of all kinds, not just the status-driven stories, the famous stories, but stories of unique resilience, unique change, and unique adventure that have happened throughout the whole of history. And now the WOW festivals are all over the world, as you can see, and still growing. That's very exciting. Of course it is. But I do still believe that unless people feel that women's stories are about joy, happiness, and transformation, and not about victimless survival and plaintiveness, then actually, how are we going to be interested? And I suppose that's at root my feeling about entertainment as an artist. You need to excite, you need to exhilarate. So I created this idea of festivals. Because you know, if you say the word festival to somebody, they know it's going to be joyful, fun, interesting, spontaneous. And they also know they're going to have to eat and drink, and they might bump into somebody. They might have a romance. Who knows? But these are just some of the festivals and the kind of exhilaration you can see in the festivals from around the world. And then here are some of the also superstars that are real. OK, so it's not Ian McKellen playing a role. It's not Patrick Stewart playing a role. It's Angela Davis talking about her life. It's Malala talking about her life. Hindu Abraham, who's here, and Mary Robinson. They do look like they're having fun, don't they? And they are having fun. And do you know why they're having fun? And why Abdul Paveen is so transformative in her music? And why Annie Lennox is so excited in her voyage? It's because we have something to believe in, something to fight for, something to go for, which is a better world. There's nothing more exhilarating than the idea of a better world than the one we've got. I don't want you to think, though, that when I created WOW, I created it for women. I basically said, if you're a woman or you know one, it's for you. So of course, it is for men. And this is very significant. Here is a man creating work with his daughter. And this perhaps more formidable picture are a group of soldiers in Pakistan brought specifically in order to protect the WOW Festival from any kind of hostile actions, and there are hostile actions against women's festivals. But here they are, you can see, they've taken on board some of this writing, be open and honest, maintain confidentiality, share your own stories, and they're actually talking about their daughters. They're asking questions that they couldn't really ask, everything from you know, periods, education. They're asking questions that they don't have a forum to ask questions in normally. And it really makes a difference. Here's Jordan Stevens, one of the UK's famous rappers, talking about his moments when he suddenly realized that the misogyny in rap music was something which would never help his future as a father. And he really rerouted his life. And then there's Jon Snow, quite a famous journalist, as you know, talking about how he has changed his view from being a sort of macho war reporter to being somebody who really wanted to look at the psychology of equality and how he had to rethink his own attitude to his daughters as a result. Very, very moving stories. Now, I said this talk was going to be about me, and there's my dad smoking the pipe, and there's my mum, and there they are on a bench, obviously in love and romantic. How you're brought up by your parents gives you things which you either fight against or preserve. And I cannot stress enough to the fathers or proposed fathers, or possible uncles, or brothers, nephews, in the room, that your role as a man is both admired and loved and needed. But you need to know that. So here am I, one of four daughters. I'm that second, slightly chubby one. I've still got the gap in my teeth. There I am. 
And I want you to look at this. This is my mum and my dad when they're old. And can you see the way that my dad is looking at my mum? He is still admiring her. They're in the 90s. They've, they've gone now. But I could see my father supporting my mother all the way through my life. And here's my son and my granddaughter. And I can see he's basically saying to her, you're terrific. You're terrific. He's not saying to her, you're pretty. He's not saying, well, I hope you get a nice boyfriend. He's not saying, well, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't do too well, because I'll still love you. He's saying, what are your dreams? And how can I help you make those happen? And that really, really changes the game for a girl. Because, you know, we might not want patriarchy to exist, but the fact is, it does. And if patriarchy exists theologically, and in every other context in which we find ourselves as a minority voice, even though we're half of the population, of course we look to men and go, do you approve of me? Do you legitimize me? Do I matter? We might not want to ask those questions, and as we get older, we can sometimes bitterly resent it. But the fact is we're bound together as a species. And so the male voice counts. Now, we often talk, of course, about male sponsorship in, in business, you know, how you promote more women, da 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 But at root, it's the personal intimacy of a man with, obviously, his partner, but somebody who is looking to him as the hero. This is what counts. Now, the Hope Brigade is the big exhibition outside. I just want you to read, if you can, this from Helena Kennedy brought up as a little girl in Scotland, really from a very poor background, now one of the great QCs in the world, particularly talking about human rights. She talks about the huge influence her father had on her, how he encouraged her, how he believed in her. And this, at the end, he was never invasive or overprotective. This is critical, too. You know, you don't want your dad to be telling you that you basically better hide behind him. No, you want to be out on your own knowing that he's got your back. And here we have a senator from Pakistan, Krishna Kumari Kohli. What a fantastic statement here. It was my father's dream to see me succeed beyond means as a poverty-stricken stricken bonded laborers. So you know, all over the world, whatever place you'll find girls and women in, there'll be dads rooting for their daughters. And there'll be dads who are indifferent. And there'll be dads who are hostile. And there'll be dads who walk away. And there'll be dads who'll kind of pat them on the head and, you know, fit them in. And we know the difference. So here's a really sad testimony. This is Wana Ubagang from Nigeria talking about that her father was a violent presence in the household. And when he left, his violence and then abandonment had a huge sense of, of made her feel worthless. And she's been struggling all her life to write about that. But, you know, you shouldn't begin your life with pain. If a woman and a mama kind of ignores their daughter or their son, it's very painful. But if a father does it, it seems to speak of the whole world. And that's the difference. So we all know that Malala's father, Yusuf Zay, really championed her like mad. And I'll tell you a story about this, that when Malala came to WOW in Bradford and spoke at a, a huge conference of families who'd come to listen to Malala. She got sick, and she had to phone in. And so her dad came instead, you so say. And he talked to the whole group of people about how he believed that you should never clip a girl's wings. And the result of his talk meant that five different families decided that they wouldn't send their children off to Pakistan, their daughters off to Pakistan, to be married. Instead, they'd allow them to do further education. Now, I believe that if Malala had given that talk, the dads would not necessarily have been convinced. It was the dad giving the talk that made them think, OK, I, I trust this as a guy. So as women, we want to think our voices are equal in the world, and yet at the same time, we know they're not. So we have to ask men, men who we love, to join in, not as helpmates, but because if you want a different world, and you wouldn't be in Davos if you didn't, then what is it you need to do? It's a weird thing, you know, when I say to people, look, this is what Zouadin says, from the moment my daughter Malala was born, 
I wanted to experience the world. I wanted to have her own identity. I wanted to be the kind of father who would encourage her. Now, not all of you in this room are fathers, but I can tell you that when you say to somebody, you know, something, 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 women, something, 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 if their eyes don't glaze over, they'll often say to you, oh, I've just had a daughter, or I've got a daughter. And you know, there's part of you who wants to say, well, you've probably got a woman, partner as well, maybe a wife. You know, you had a mother, sister at all. Why have you only just now started thinking about it? But I don't want to be cynical. I mean, yes, maybe you're thinking about it because suddenly it's the future, it's the legacy, there they are, and it's yours. So, you know, there's something maybe about that which needs examining, but the point is we do want the best for our children. Or do we? Does it depend who the children are? So let's just examine some facts here. Indira and Clara. So this is Indira Gandhi, the second longest serving prime minister of India. Her father, Nehru, obviously supported and championed her. But you know what? She was the only child. So supposing she had had brothers, would she have been Indira Gandhi that I grew up with when I was a little girl, thinking women can be prime ministers? The first lady to be actually christened an Iron Lady by Henry Kissinger? Maybe not. Because when fathers have the choice between the son and the daughter, do they choose the son? And this, perhaps less known to you, Friedrich Mann, who was a very, very uh, important uh, musician in his time, he had a daughter, Clara Schumann. She was a magnificent protégé. She performed as a concert pianist, as a composer. Uh, she died when she was 88. She married Robert Schumann. She was very famous. We're recovering her history now. She was the only child. So, of course, he poured his investment into her and her alone. But then, if you look at the story of Mozart, Mozart had a sister, Marie Anne. They both performed together over the whole of Europe. She was often given top billing. She was taken off the platform when she was 16 because she was of marriageable age and you've never heard of her. And this is the thing. We can carry on with a world that keeps demonstrating over and over again that given the opportunity, a woman can be the prime minister, a woman can be the concert pianist and the composer, or given the opportunity, a boy will take their place instead. But surely then there's places for everyone. We're not in short supply of places in the world for things to happen. So I want to come to you at this point and, and ask you, really, as a, as a group of people, who, anybody here have a daughter? This is not a therapy session, incidentally. Just going to be really clear. Has anybody here got a daughter? <laughs> OK, well, let's, let's start with the men. How do you feel about your daughter, if you don't mind me asking? I mean, what's your ambition for her? Yeah, I would like her to be successful professionally and do everything that she yeah. So you'd like her to be professional and successful and do everything you like. Have you got any sons? No, I have two daughters, both married. Uh huh. Yeah, educated in London, uh, did their graduation and uh, married with their own choice. Yes. Yeah. That's a fantastic history, and I'm sure they love you and admire you for that freedom that you've given them. Yeah. Can you pass forward? Please. You got a daughter? I have a daughter. Yes. What's your relationship to that journey for her? I want her to be resilient because I know the challenges she's going to face. So it's really important for me to train her to face adversity so she can deal with those bumps. Uh, yeah. It's important that she's strong. Yeah. Now, isn't this interesting? I mean, of course we train boys to face up to the issues of the world. But one of the things that happens often when men have daughters is they go, oh, my God. Look at the world. Look at the world for women. Oh, no. I have a daughter. How is she going to be resilient? Because she's going to need to be. And this is not a kind of pointing fingers at you. But very often, men haven't created the circumstances in advance for their daughters. They've been waiting for the daughter arrives, and then they think, I better sort of run around and try solving things. We have to solve things on an ongoing basis for all daughters, futures, and not just our own. Anybody else here got a daughter? I'm staying with the men for a bit. OK, we'll have this one over here. Yep. Hi. I have two daughters, teenagers, and I'd like them to be happy in life. Yes. 
How would you get, allow them to be happy? I'd like them to uh, explore what they like, what they're interested in, and encourage them to pursue those things in life. Yeah. Hopefully help them do it. Okay, I'm gonna pass on to you. You've got a daughter, and presumably, a, you do, are you a single mom? Have you got a husband? Okay, let's come to you. Okay, wait till the microphone comes, thanks. Hi, so I have a 12-year-old daughter who I adopted, and yeah. she, I'm a single mom, and I live in Pakistan, which is contrary to the general norms. <coughs> Uh, and uh, I want her to be empowered, and I want her to find her own voice, and that's really what I'm working towards. Yes. Now, there is a lot of evidence that single mums, when their daughters and their sons, actually, realise how they have to double down in terms of work, in terms of everything, there's a lot of evidence that actually that powers up children mm -hmm. because, you know, they're grateful and they see it. Um, the issue of... Oh, you haven't got a boy? No. Just a girl. Did you choose a girl? Yes, I did. Because? Uh, because I, want, I, I work for women's economic empowerment. That's what I do in Pakistan. Yeah. So I, def, I just wanted to uh, you know, pass on the legacy to another uh, young child. Yeah. Uh, I did think about a boy, but I personally felt that this was something that I could pass on better to yeah. a, a girl. And, and I can speak from experience. I have a boy and a girl. And I have a, two, children, two grandchildren, boy and a girl. And I did, to begin with, hope that my first child would be a girl because I actually, as one of four daughters, had never had any brothers. So I didn't really know, like, well, how do you do boys? Um, I mean, I was able to do boys in a different way, but in terms of rearing, I wasn't sure. And the key issue with my son has been, how do you find the language to a boy or to a man that actually confronts the issue of power imbalance between a boy and a girl, between a man and a woman. How do you have that conversation without it feeling as if you're attacking? Mm -hmm. It's really a difficult one. And, and daughters who are speaking to their dads, even though they absolutely often adore them and love them, they often are very kind and evade actually confronting their father about the deficits in his behavior. So we know that men get a lot of praise for doing some quite normal things that women do all the time. Um, and that can allow the man to think, well, you know, I'm doing my stuff. If you actually double down on like, well, no, but the reality of what needs to be done, the amount of emotional uh, journey you need to go on, the thought change you need to go on, and also the embrace of the whole world, not just me. These are things that are, I mean, are hard to talk about between children, particularly fathers to daughters, when you don't want to hurt your dad's feelings. Anybody else got a... Yes, Anjali? Well, I got a daughter, and uh, I want to give her the education my mom and dad both gave me. Both of them was very, were very important in my life. My father was my champion and the champion of my mother. And they told me that when my father asked, my mom said, when my father asked to marry her, she said to my father, I have a passion, is it th in it fear? I'm willing to start a family with you, but my goal is to become a theater director and have my own theater. My father said, no brainer. So that's what my, my mom did. And I've seen in a conservative society, a man like my father went through hell lost most of his friends and his family too because he was very supportive of my mother and all his children, boys and girls, equal. He said, what is right for the girl, mm -hmm. guy, the boys, is right for the girl. Here there's no, no one on top of the other. We are all equal in this house. So I try to bring that also to my daughter. And she's becoming a young woman that I'm, I'm, I'm admiring in her journey in being an actress, a writer, and thinking full, full, I mean, full responsibility for it. Yeah. So, I, you know, in a sense, I, I'm going to end this uh, bit of audience discussion on that point. Men take flack for supporting women. You know, you know that. In the pub, in the, you know, in the kind of restaurant, if you bring up the subject of equality, it's not too long before you get, oh, come on, don't be so heavy, or do you have to? You know, it's a difficult one. 
And if in front of a boy and a girl, you take the girl's side, the boy can quickly, having learned very easily at nursery and school, very quickly go, you know, are you giving the girl empowerment? Are you putting me down? You know, where do I stand? All these issues are very difficult. But I think that unless together men and women think carefully about bringing up girls in relationship to bringing up boys, we're asking women as they are older to do all the hard work on their own. And it's no use coming back again afterwards and patting them on the back and saying, it's great you did it. You need to be there forging the path with them. And that means more than just talking to your daughter or your niece or whoever, whoever young woman in your life you love. You need to spread that out and basically share it with other men. Now, I, I started this talk really saying this is about me. I feel that I have been given this huge gift of confidence and legitimacy, yes, by my mother, but particularly by my father. And that has meant that when other men have, you know, marginalised, patronised, whatever, casually, sometimes not always intentionally by any means, I don't kind of fall into a pit of thinking I don't really matter. I think, no, I, I, I matter. So it also makes me able to be, I think, affectionate, because my starting point is that I love a man, and I love men, because love is able to be part of how I think of men. So this talk this morning, you know, yes, of course, it's for women, because we're all here doing our thing, but I particularly wanted to say to men, please don't think, A, we don't need you, and B, that you aren't the massive influence that we keep telling you off for. You know, we're telling you off for being such a big thing in the world, but bearing in mind you are a big thing in the world, please use it for the benefit of girls and women. At the moment, this is um, a uh, picture. Again, there I am, the second. Here is the bus that we're taking on tour at the moment, the WOW bus. We're touring it around different parts of the country in the UK, and then we're hoping to take it around different parts of the world. It's a recording studio. You can make podcasts in it. You can do art classes in it. It, it allows girls to come to wherever it is and just feel as if they matter and they're special. It's a sort of touring girls' festival. Now, when I was a little girl, my father was one of 14 children, and he was the youngest of the 10 that survived. And I was brought up in an area of Liverpool called Toxteth, which actually is quite a difficult place uh, in its history. It's had quite a lot of riots. And my grandfather always said to me, never forget you're the third in, meaning that the first immigrants were the Chinese because it was a sailing space. The second in were the West African sailors, and the third in were the Irish. And then there have been uh, many others. And when I left Toxus, because we became upwardly mobile, we went away from so many stories and became to a place where there were fewer stories and the stories were white, because that's where we lived. And it's taken me a long time to be able to get back into the world of through WOW, where unless we're hearing all the stories of the world, we can't make sense of it all, and we can't rely on AI to just come up with the algorithms to make sense for us. This is a human issue. So when I look at these girls here, and I don't know them, but I do know that they'll have their struggles, they'll have their difficulties, but I want them to succeed as much as I have been able to succeed. Here am I, a little girl from Liverpool, speaking at Davos. And I want them to feel that the world is their oyster. But I do know that in the end, a lot of their confidence will come from this. There's my dad, training to be in bomber command when he was 18, wanting to fight fascism. And there he is, looking quite cool with his glasses rowing a boat. <laughs> supposing he just didn't give a toss, but supposing he hadn't really spent any time with me, supposing he didn't really care. I promise you, that would have made a massive difference to who I am today. So, as we reach the end of my story and my storytelling, really what I'm trying to say is that silencing girls around their dreams is the, the thing that we do that takes away their rights from the beginning. And we know that women's rights are conditional, and we know that because we can see Afghanistan take them away like that. We can see regimes take away rights if they wish to. And unless men fight for women's rights because it's a world that they want, 
that they believe in, like my dad did, then we're doing it on our own with one hand tied behind our back. Mm -hmm. So let's not do that. The reason why all those women in the pictures look so exhilarated was because to not today is the day that we've never had before. We are standing on the future. And our future does not have to just be about the jeopardy of climate change and the terror of AI. It can be about the joy of human progress. And that cannot happen unless we're going to be equal in hum as humans in every way. Thank you.